Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to How to Market Your Practice for 2014 and how to have a three to four week waiting list for new clients. Uh, for those who haven't had the privilege of meeting before, my name is Dr. Tom Preston, and I'm, I'm honored you're with us tonight. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here and to invest in yourself, uh, invest in your business, invest in your purpose, invest in uh, what it is that, or at least part of the reason why you're put here on the planet Earth uh, to fulfill your role as a entrepreneur, as a chiropractor, and help the world be a, a better place for it. So, And there's lots of places you can be spending your time tonight. As I said, I'm honored that you're uh, spending time with us tonight, and I look forward to uh, being your, uh, your host, if you will, your tour guide for the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes as we work our way through this uh, wonderful world of, of uh, marketing and what it means to uh, literally create a waiting list practice. So um, I've got several intents for why I put this program together tonight and I'm thinking that probably it's going to speak to, uh, to some of you in one way or the other so let me just run through those. This is what I feel like uh, you should be on this call for, for at least one if not more of these reasons. Um, literally to start this off, we got the title for this particular uh, webinar tonight because this was what I had when I ran a practice. We ran a three to four week waiting list for new clients during the zenith of my practice and it was the principles I'm going to share with you tonight that's going to allow you, if you choose, to embrace in order to have also that level of um, possibility or that level of service you know, in, your, uh, in your practice. Um, the other sort of not so hidden agenda, particularly for those of you that I know and those that get the privilege of serving as a coach advisor, is I want to see more people under chiropractic care. I feel like this is definitely part of the evolution of humanity is to get more people connected and aware to their uh, most authentic self, more people's nerve systems working at a higher level, and the more people that you can maybe put under care as a result of something I can say tonight or something I can inspire you to do in your practice, then it'll have been worth our time together uh, tonight for sure. Um, so as a byproduct of getting more people under care, you're going to be more successful. You're going to feel more fulfilled as a human being, and uh, that's going to have a ripple effect into everybody and every life you touch in and out of your business. Uh, your family, your significant other, your friends, and so on. So there's a ripple effect here to you know, us spending time together tonight that is going uh, beyond outside of just the business aspects. Um, there may be some of you today that are quite successful in practice and maybe already have a good handle on the marketing side of things, but you'd like to get more stability. And I would like to see you have more stability, less of an emotional, emotional roller coaster going on in your business. And so by creating uh, more structure and more understanding uh, around marketing, you definitely can do that. Uh, another aspect I want to touch on here, folks, is the concept of succession. And I want you all, whether you've been in practice for months or years or decades, to start thinking about succession and what it means to literally pass the torch. Certainly I've had some great um, mentors and guides and coaches in my life, which is uh, definitely the shortcut to the degree that I've been successful in my life and my career. I would owe it definitely to that um, those mentors and those guides, those coaches in my life that have, that have helped me get to where I am. But, you know, anything that I can share with you tonight that might inspire you or, or teach you something new, I'm hoping you can take that and, and pass it on to the people that you serve and to your uh, associates, independent contractors, or the person that may come in to take over your practice. Which brings up the final issue tonight, folks, which is the concept of exit planning. Uh, many entrepreneurs, particularly people in the healthcare industry, don't seem to understand that they're not going to practice forever, that someday they're actually going to exit their business. And having an exit strategy and starting to think about that uh, is, again, is very, very wise. And if you have a more systemized business, particularly as it relates to all of the big important systems like marketing and education and teamwork and so on, uh, the more valuable, quite frankly, your sweat equity that you built into your business over the years is going to be. So there's lots of reasons uh, why uh, um, I think you should be uh, here tonight, why you should be paying attention tonight, why you may choose to pass along some of this knowledge to uh, some of your friends and colleagues that maybe didn't make it here tonight. And uh, as a result of our time together, I'm hoping that you're going to be um, that much more informed and that much uh, better to, to serve the world. So I want to take a little poll, folks, before we get going here, which is really uh, quite simple. Um, you should see that pop up on the side of your screen, which is how many of you have a written marketing plan that you follow? So just to answer that simply yes or no, so we get a little bit of a, a sense for where we're starting tonight. And then as a result of uh, understanding where we're starting, we'll have a, a better understanding about where it is that we, uh, that we need to go. So again, have a look at that, uh, that chat, and, uh, or sorry, that poll, and uh, how many of you have a written marketing plan that you actually follow? It's one thing to have a written marketing plan, folks. It's quite another thing to, uh, to actually be, uh, be following it. 
Um, I want to, as you guys are doing that, we can multitask here just a little bit. I want to um, kick into some of the data or content tonight by telling you a story about a young gentleman who came to see me uh, many years ago when I was in more active practice, and his name was Francois. And Francois was a really interesting little guy, and his mother had heard me do a talk somewhere because I was willing to step out of my comfort zone and, and market. And she got under care and had some phenomenal changes uh, for her health. And she said to me one day, she said, Dr. Tom, do you think there's anything you can do for my son, Francois? And I said, well, tell me about Francois. And she said, well, Francois was born a very sick little guy right from the day he was born. It was a very traumatic birth. And uh, based upon what you've told me, I think he could have been subluxated right from the birth process itself. As a result of that, he's had numerous uh, upper respiratory infections and tubes in his ears. He's had three different sets. He's been on, uh, he's been asthmatic since he was quite young. He's been on inhalers. He takes nine different medications every day just to uh, allow himself to function on a daily basis. On average, even though he does very well and finishes top two in his class usually, he is, uh, uh, misses school a tremendous amount. He misses over 100 days a year which kind of blew me away if you think about it because there probably isn't more than a couple hundred days of school that the kids even go to and he was missing up to a hundred a year just because he was sick so often. And uh, I said, and she said the other thing that's happened is with all the steroids he's been on it's stunted his growth and even though he's 14 years old or almost 14 years old he's, he's very small for his age. He's, he's you know, just barely over four feet tall. So I said, well you know what, I don't know but if his uh, potential is being limited by the presence of uh, nervous system interference which I call subluxation then maybe there's something we can do for him so why don't you bring him in and we'll check him out. And we brought him out and, uh, and brought him in, sorry, and sure enough, he was very subluxated. And as a result of our analysis and getting him uh, uh, under care and getting him adjusted, I started to notice changes in Francois. And literally, as the weeks turned into months, uh, I would hear him come in and say, you know what, Dr. Tom, I, I haven't taken you know, this or that medication, and I haven't needed my puffers off, and, and, and so on and so forth. And because we only have a compressed period of time tonight, folks, I'll uh, cut to the chase. The changes in Francois were absolutely revolutionary. Uh, by the end of seven and a half or uh, eight or nine months of care, he was off of uh, seven of his nine meds. Um, he was down. He hadn't missed literally the, the record. He had gone three entire weeks without missing a day of school, which at that point was a record in his entire uh, almost nine years that he'd been in the, in the school system. He was in, I think, the ninth grade when we started with him. And uh, he got to the point where he didn't need his, his puffer anymore. And there's, I mean, it's just one of those beautiful Carpentic Miracle stories. But, you know, folks, just think, if I hadn't been able to understand these concepts I'm going to share with you tonight, if I hadn't been courageous enough to get off my butt and get out there and, and, and market and to tell the world the story that I have to share, share the biggest and bestest within me for the world, which we'll talk about later when we get into the code of the trader, Francois never would have got under care. And how would his life be different today, folks? Francois went on to university. He ended up finding a beautiful uh, young lady. He ended up getting married. He's got three children today. He's a very productive uh, computer analyst. Uh, he's leading a very, very different life than the path that he would have led had he not found out about chiropractic care. So I tell you that story, folks, A, because it's very near and dear to my heart. His mother ended up being so inspired by what we did that she ended up uh, actually working for us for many years as a, as a chiropractic assistant. And I can tell you, folks, uh, that's the kind of assistant you want, one that's inspired, that's had a life-changing story, because she told everybody that story, both in and out of the office, and was indirectly responsible for, uh, I don't even I don't even a clue, I would guess at 50 or 60 people getting under care herself. So um, let's just uh, know folks that, that you make a difference in the world and that being able to share your light and share your gifts to the world is really one of the ways that more people like Francois are going to have a, a chance at leading a, a somewhat normal life. So let's just see where we're at here relative to uh, how many of you have a written marketing plan? 20% said yes and 80% said no. So apparently uh, your this particular uh, demographic or audience we got together tonight is not that different than the rest of the profession. There's a very small minority of the profession. I was I would, I've always said 15 to 20 percent that actually uh, have a written marketing plan and follow it. So I would suggest that uh, as a result of uh, our, our this demographic tonight isn't a lot different than the average in the profession. So um, we're off to uh, we're, we're you're on the right call. I guess is the moral of the story, folks. So. Um, I did want to uh, get into the, the content tonight, and I really want to start with the why, because I contend that uh, the why you do anything is more important than the hows. And I've traced this all the way back to Plato and Aristotle, and you know it's, it's been framed in this way. When your why is big enough, the hows look after, the self, you look after themselves. So the question really, folks, is, is why do you want to market? And I've, I've kind of touched on it a little bit in the introduction, but let's just get into it a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, more in depth. 
Uh, Einstein said that you can look at the universe as if everything's a miracle or nothing's a miracle. You can't prove it one way or the other. But the consequence of your thinking makes a huge impact on what it is that uh, you, you, you do and, and how you live your life. And so I would take that and run with it a little bit, folks, and I would say that from my perspective, you can either look at the universe as if we're, uh, and the people that are here on the planet as if we're um, human beings having a spiritual experience, or you can look at it like we're spiritual beings having a human experience. You can't prove it one way or the other, in my opinion, from some randomized, controlled, double-blind, you know, scientific trial. This is not a moral discussion, and you're not right or wrong if you believe one or the other, but there's a consequence to believing one or the other. And for me, I strongly feel and know for me that my truth, my worldview, is that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And as a result of that, I feel like each one of us is like a very significant um, chain link, and that together we all link together to form this magnificent thing called humanity, the seven point whatever billion of us there are on the planets today. And that each one of us has a desire to express ourselves in a certain specific way. Each one of us has a desire to innately express what I call our most authentic self to the world. And that may show up in our, our family life and in our social life and our physical life, but it certainly shows up in our careers. I would offer folks that, that every innate living thing has a desire to express itself. A goose always wants to go south every winter. A moth always wants to go to a light. A, a salmon always wants to go up the same stream every spring. Every innate living thing has a desire to express itself. You have a desire to express yourself in a certain unique way. I have a desire to express myself. Whatever, what is that that's inside of us that wants out, that wants to express? That's what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual beings, you know, having a human experience. And whatever that is inside of you folks as it relates to your career, I would offer that there are no mistakes uh, on this planet, that there are no mistakes in your life, that you're on this call for a reason, you're on this program for a reason, that you're in this profession for a reason, and that you've got some gifts to share with the world as it results from that. If you can embrace that, folks, or you can even hallucinate with me about that, or you can even share my worldview, the consequence of that worldview is profound. Because when you get that, you realize how interconnected we all are, and when you realize that we're that interconnected, you don't want to be the weakest link, folks, like that goofy television show a few years ago. And when I got that, that, that my, the things that I do and how I express myself to the world interacts with every other human on the planet, and it has a ripple effect like the like the, the butterfly effect, you know, the, the, the story goes that the butterfly flaps at wings in Africa and we have a, you know, a hurricane in, in North America. Well, it's true, folks, that there's a ripple effect to everything in life. And let me just uh, illustrate an example of this. Um, when I was back in practice, uh, more active practice years ago, um, I built this, designed and built this beautiful 5,400 square foot to mausoleum of an office with four, four plex it was. And we had beautiful, you know, peaked uh, ceilings, cathedral ceilings with big, Florida ceiling windows. I mean, it was just it was absolutely gorgeous. And uh, my team at the time, Sandra and Sharon, were, were very dedicated uh, assistants and were great at what they did. But And one of the rules that I had in my practice, and I do highly recommend you have rules and guidelines in your practice, folks, but one guideline I had is that I never got disrupted when I was in the flow. Never got disrupted short of, uh, you know, fire, pestilence, famine, uh, or one of my very significant family members who were told not to call unless it was an emergency called. And so I rarely ever got, you know, disrupted. But there's one day that Sandra showed up in the adjusting area, one of my assistants, and uh, I knew that I was in for uh, an experience, folks, because she showed up with a plunger over her shoulder, okay? <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I've never had that experience before in business. And so she showed up and I said, uh, yeah, Sandra, what's up? I, I, I'm in prime time here. And she goes, uh, well, Doc, um, I double-checked my schedule and my contract, and I didn't see it in the fine print. Uh, she said, so this is not my job. So I'm pretty sure, therefore, since you're the leader of our merry little band here, it's got to be your job. So um, Johnny just hurt uh, something that resembles about a three-and-a-half-pound uh, turd in the toilet, and it's uh, f flooding the front area, the reception area, and somebody's got to do something about it. Well, I don't know about you folks, but that didn't exactly, you know, excite me a great deal. <laughs> that didn't exactly get me, um, you know, revved up. So what's the first thing you're going to do? Well, the first thing I did was I went to look for my plumber's name. And I called Mark and I said, Mark, I'm in a crisis. I need you, buddy. And Mark came over and dealt with uh, Johnny's uh, um, birth process, which is pretty much all you can call a three-pound turd, folks, from my perspective. And as a result of Mark, uh, the reason I, I knew to call Mark is because Mark was willing to stand up and stand out. And, I mean, he had billboards in town and he had uh, a website and he had, you know, 
uh, B&I groups that he went to and stuff. And I, I mean, I interact with Mark all over the place. And I tried Mark out. He was actually a great plumber. And, and what was also surprising to me, folks, he was inspired by plumbing. He was incredibly inspired by plumbing. He really wanted to, uh, to, to, you know, to do, a, do a great job as it relates to plumbing, which is great because I'm not inspired to go and deal with toilets and all of that kind of stuff. So I could rest my mind at ease. I could do what I was put on the planet to do because I had somebody who was inspired to do what they were meant to do on the planet, go and do it, which allowed me to do what I was meant to do. And that's the ripple effect I'm talking about. That's the interconnectedness of the, of the chain link that I see. And if you get that, you own that, folks, I tell you, it'll change your life. Because I'm not arrogant enough to be the, the weak link to, to, to break this, and I'm not naive enough to not know that. And that, folks, is your why. That's what's inside of you that wants out. And when you get that at a deep spiritual level, it'll change your life. Because you can't not share your gifts to the world. One of my favorite um, writers, the philosopher Ayn Rand, talks about the code of the traitor. And the code of the traitor basically says that all of us have within us this, this gift that I just described that, that wants to be shared. And you have a moral, and I would allow, uh, if you allow me to, to you know, stay on the spiritual train for a minute, a spiritual covenant to share that with your you know, other brothers and sisters on the planet. A moral and a spiritual covenant to share that with the world via the code of the traitor. And when you do, you have the full right to share it unabashed and fully, 100%, not at 50%, at 100%. And to share those gifts with the world and to reap the benefits of the, that exchange with the world fully for the value that you offer the world. Now, value is definitely in the eye of the beholder. There's a perception thing here, folks, which is why professional athletes get paid, in my opinion, absurd amounts of money for the amount of value they have to the world. I love my professional athletes. I think they're very talented. And yes, there's a certain unique uh, niche of them that can actually do some of the things that we're probably going to see in the, you know, in, in the hockey games and football games and stuff that are going on right now. But the reason that they make the income they do is because someone perceives the value. And I've never heard of a professional athlete saying, I make $7 million a year and I'm ashamed of that. <laughs> I've never met, I would like to say I've never met an entrepreneur that says, I make X amount of money per year because I f provide a phenomenal product or service to humanity that, that is my link in the chain of life. And if I don't perform that, that function, there are many other lives that aren't going to be touched as a result. I want to share with you folks a hypothetical story. But you know what? I don't know if it's as hypothetical as, as what I'm going to make it out to be. Because to me, this is as real as, uh, as any story I could ever tell. But I want to tell a story of uh, a little gentleman. And uh, let's just say for the sake of argument, we're going to call uh, this little guy. This goes back a few years. This is going back, you know, uh, maybe 30 years or so. We're going to call this little guy Barack. And Barack is a, a timid little gentleman, and he's got a great relationship with his teacher in his second grade class. And he's very, very nervous because he hates to think about even speaking in front of people. And the thought of having to go and do his very first oral presentation in front of his grade two classmates has just got him completely freaked out. And Mrs. Russell, his saintly, kindly old maternal, you know, grade two teacher, says, now, Barack, don't you worry. I'm going to be here to look after you and, and coach you through it, and you're going to be fine. And she counsels him and advises him and consoles him and finally gets up to the, you know, to the big day, and Barack says to Mom, he says, Mom, I think I can do it because Mrs. Russell is going to help me all the way through this. And to Barack's horror, he gets to school that day, and Mrs. Russell isn't there. And the reason Mrs. Russell isn't there is because you – didn't fulfill your spiritual and moral obligation to your brothers and sisters to share the biggest and bestest within you. Because you didn't get out there and market. You didn't get out there and tell the world what the gift is that you have to share with the world. And as a result of that, the horrible pukey migraine headache that Mrs. Russell woke up with that day, because she wasn't in your office, she wasn't getting her nerve system checked, she wasn't getting adjusted. As a result of not having that experience, she's on some bizarre medication, she's laid up for the day, and they have a young temp in that day when young Barack gets up in front of the class to give his presentation, it is beyond a nightmare. The kids laugh at him. He literally is, is embarrassed. The teacher doesn't know how to support him. She's kind of laughing along with him. She's a young goofball. And Barack has the most horrible experience of his life. And as a result of that experience, he knows, amongst many other things, that he will never, ever get up in front of another group of people and speak. Now, who's to say that Barack isn't the great-grandson of, uh, you know, Barack Obama, the you know, president of the United States currently? 
Who's to say that as a result of him not being able to become the great orator that, that he could become if he follows in his grandfather's footsteps? Who's to say that he's not the guy that is the leader of some nation, maybe the United States has one frame of reference, and as a result of that, he's not at the UN one day when there's a vote that literally could stop you know, nuclear holocaust. And the world is changed, or the world is annihilated, because you didn't get off your butt and get out and share your story. You weren't willing to exchange your gifts with the world via the code of the trader without remorse, without guilt, fully and freely sharing them on the open market so the world can say yes or no. And, and whether they do or they don't is not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to share your gifts with the world. That's your why, folks. It's a spiritual and moral covenant. And if you can get that, if you can own that, everything else we're going to talk about tonight, quite frankly, is just icing on the cake. Because when the why is big enough, the hows will look after themselves. All right, folks. Well, listen, let's get into some of the hows. And, and, and particularly, I want to start and carry on with this part of it by talking about the most common blocks to marketing. Because I'm going to guarantee you that there are people on this call that at some level have got, at least intellectually, what I just said. But I, I, I can share with you from 17 years of professional as a consultant advisor that knowing something up here and getting it down here in your heart, getting it in your mitochondrial cell walls is a completely different experience. And so those of you who understand, at least intellectually, that you have your gifts to share with the world and you have a moral and or spiritual covenant to, to share those with your brothers and sisters without remorse, without guilt, fully and charge a very fair fee for your service and, and just reap the rewards of that exchange you know, beautifully. If you understand that intellectually and you're not doing it, then you're literally living a lie. You're literally living something that the Buddha called not knowing. Because the Buddha said to know and to not act is to in fact not to really know. So there's a piece missing somewhere and I've studied this fairly intensely folks and I've come up with 10 of the most common blocks to marketing. And What I'd like you to do is just take out a, a pen and paper if you haven't already and I'd like you to just give yourself a, a grade as we go through these 10 items uh, from 1 to 10. And if you score yourself a 10, it's like, it's a non-issue for me. I got it both intellectually and at a cell level, and I just own the concept. A 1 means, yeah, this is a huge issue for me. I've, I've, you know, I've got some problems here. I've got some definitely some work to do. And obviously, anywhere between 1 and 10, you decide where you score. Don't think too much about this, folks. Just, just, just you know, go with the number that pops into the theater of your mind, okay? The first one we've already talked about is basically what we've talked about in the, in the start of this call all the way through so far, which is not understanding the why of marketing. And as a result of what we just went through, if you were conscious at all, I'm suggesting that you're listening, um, you probably understand it better. But again, there's a difference between understanding it here and knowing it here. So score yourself out of 10. 10 is, it's not, a, it's not an issue for me. I've got my why, it's a 10 out of 10. One is, it's a big issue for me, obviously anywhere in between. Number two, fear of the unknown. I contend, folks, years ago when we still lived in the caves and were, uh, you know, wondering what that big uh, sharp tooth animal was outside that was kind of salivating when we stepped out of the cave. Uh, we realized that when Bob stepped out of the cave and he went to that thing that he didn't understand and didn't know, um, he didn't come back and he got taken out of the gene pool. <laughs> so I contend that there's an innate, uh, uh, you know, inbred genetic uh, and or epigenetic fear within us of something that we don't understand or something uh, that we don't know about. And since most of us didn't study, we didn't get a, an MBA or uh, some sort of a degree in marketing, um, we don't understand this thing called marketing. And so as a result of that, we just have a fear of what we don't know, a fear of the unknown. And again, score yourself out of 10, folks. 10, not an issue. One, it's a big issue for you. The third issue that I've seen come across over and over again in my coach consulting work is a fear of failure. Nobody likes to fail. Nobody likes to admit they don't know anything. And there's a whole added thing here because, you know, the vast majority of people in the call are doctors or work for doctors. And so we're supposed to be these, like, knowledgeable people in society who, you know, quite frankly, some people believe we should just know everything, which is a total crock of crap, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but regardless of, of that sort of mystique that the public and society has for us, most people just don't like to fail. And if you've got to this level of life, it's because, you know, you got something going on and you're uh, definitely a driven person. So it's not so much about uh, not... Uh, um, having the possibility to be able to know how to get into this thing called marketing and be able to share your, more of your gifts to the world. It's just literally the fear of not knowing where to start and therefore you just the fear of failure. This is really amplified in men, I find, because it's the reason, and for any of you ladies in the call, it's the reason why guys want to ask for directions. Guys hate to be wrong. We're very simple beings. We're zeros and ones. We're binary code. And anything that isn't a clear win for us is a loss. <laughs> 
And so if we admit that we don't understand something or don't know how to do it, we're better to just not even try sometimes rather than admit that we don't understand or don't know. So that fear of failure can definitely be a block. Ten, not an issue. One, it's a big issue for you. Number four, not wanting to waste time. Who wants to waste time? We're in this society today where everything's moving faster and going quicker, and as a result of that, there's just time is at a very premium. It is my most precious commodity in my life, way more so than anything else in my life, particularly including money. And so not wanting to waste time because we don't know how to do things or don't know how to get the best bang for a buck and where to spend our time. We don't want to waste our time, so we just do nothing. Or we do very little. Again, huge error in judgment. Ten, that's not an issue. One, it's an issue for you, not wanting to waste time. Number five, not wanting to waste money. It's just basically an extension of the time one, but you know, I remember talking and doing a consult with this uh, gentleman who remained nameless and a well-known chiropractor who'd invested $35,000 in a marketing campaign from some fancy schmancy you know, uh, upscale marketing house. And basically, when we actually worked through it all, uh, about $1,000 of that $35,000 is what they ended up seeing over the course of the 16-month contract. It was an absolute colossal nightmare. It was the worst I'd ever seen in a, in a big scale marketing campaign that he just delegated or deferred all of the responsibility without even trying to figure it out, not even knowing if they were making good decisions. And obviously they weren't because he didn't see hardly any return on investment because it didn't bring in any new people. And so again, you don't want to waste your money, folks. And that can be a real fear. It can be a block to taking action. So again, one, it's a big problem for you. Ten, it's not a problem. Number six. Fear of rejection on the personal side. Uh, there's a lot of people that just have that innate fear of being rejected. And they're thinking if they offer themselves, if they give themselves out there, and people don't want what they have to offer, then it's, it's like rejection, and I just can't handle that much rejection because largely people are somewhat insecure with who they are and what their gifts are, and they don't understand their gifts, and they don't know how to share them. So as a result of that, they just, they just don't do things. And they don't want to get rejected, so they, they just stick their head in the sand like an ostrich. One of my mentors, Dr. Joe Felicia, God rest his soul, he had a great analogy. He said, you know, when you're out there marketing to the world, it's like you're in a hotel and you wake up in the night and you, you smell smoke and the fire alarms aren't going off. And so you're going from door to door to door, knocking, 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 you know, on the door and saying, there's a fire, there's a fire, please, you know, please come, please come, please get out of the building. And some will come to the door and they'll rush out and follow you and some will come to the door and tell you you're a nut and shut the door and some people won't even answer the door. But what has that got to do with your desire to save people's lives and to get out there and make a difference with what it is that's inside of you? It's the same thing, folks, with sharing your gifts, regardless of what phase of life you're in or what kind of an entrepreneur you are. And in this case, largely healthcare professionals. It's about sharing, folks, what people do with it. It's like Wayne Dyer says. He says, other people's opinion to me are none of my business. Because people are going to think what they think regardless of what. And the law of balanced energy says that 50% of people at any given time like you and 50% of the people dislike you regardless of what you do. <laughs> so, so why not just do what you're called to do, what you're authentically called to do from within as I started the call with. You'll completely get over that. If that's not an issue for you, it's a 10. If it's a big issue, score a 1. Number 7. It's tied to this one, but it's got a little bit more of a professional flavor. It's fear of rejection professionally. These are the underdogs of the, of the profession who think that, you know, other doctors of whatever form are smarter than they are and what if they you know were out there and they're, they're doing a talk and what if like the PhD from the university's there or the MD's there or the naturopath or whatever and they just you know they just don't don't understand that other people's opinions are none of your business and if you're solid in your convictions and the amazing products and service you offer you've got as much right if not more right to share those gifts than anybody does from any profession. But again, it can be a big fear and a barrier. So again, score yourself out of 10 on that one. Number eight, fear of your own light or your own greatness. This one is very common, actually, because people, and, and I go back to Marianne Williamson's book on this, Return to Love, which was commonly quoted by, Mar uh, by Nelson Mandela, and it went around the internet a couple dozen times. You know, Who am I to be talented and fabulous and gorgeous? Quite frankly, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. You're playing small doesn't serve the world, right? And so again, a lot of people though are afraid of their light and what would happen to my family if I got really successful and actually I did a bunch of marketing and people actually came in, oh my God, heaven forbid. What would my friends think? What would my peer group think? What would my colleagues think? What would, what would, and they just what would with themselves right into oblivion. So again, score yourself out of 10 on that folks. Scarcity consciousness, number nine, the ninth reason that I find people just stay stuck and don't market. 
it's kind of tied to the one we just talked about, but it's basically saying, you know what, what if I do market really successfully and I do bring in more people and I get more busy? Oh my God, can I handle the volume? Oh my God, can I handle the extra money? What will I do with the extra money? Oh my goodness, money is kind of a weird evil thing and it's it, it, it makes me scared and you know uh, maybe I'll have to manage it then or maybe somebody will try and steal it from me and all of that kind of crazy mishigas that goes on inside people's heads. So again, if that's an issue for you, it's a one. If it's not an issue, it's a ten. Scarcity consciousness. And the last one, folks, is what I call burnout or carrying the load, what my coach and mentor Rick Sapu calls a super person or superman syndrome. This is where you're trying to do everything yourself. You're in the office and you're just a jack of all trades and quite likely probably a master of none. You're uh, in your assistance faces or you don't have assistance. You're trying to do everything. You're doing scans and you're doing x-rays. You're just, you know, you're just doing everything. And there almost isn't time to, to do marketing. And if there is, you're stressed out. You're doing it on the weekends. You do it on the nights. There's just no, no balance time in there. Quite frankly, you just burned out. And again, if that's you, score yourself a 1. If it's a non-issue, score yourself a 10. All right, if we've done the math properly, folks, then uh, what we uh, should have here is we should have a score out of 100. And I'd like you to just do the simple math. And let's just see uh, how many people uh, scored, uh, on the, um, scored on the questionnaire. I'm going to put a little poll up, folks. Scored on the questionnaire. 80 or higher. In other words, you scored 80 or higher, um, you've got basically very little issues with respect to the why side of marketing. So let's just uh, throw this out there and see what happens. And I saw in the chat that there's a few people who actually couldn't see the, uh, the, the um, poll last time. I apologize for that. I, uh, we're kind of new to this particular webinar platform and Sometimes, like any technology, it works, and sometimes it doesn't. So please take just a couple of minutes, folks, and let's uh, see who scored on the questionnaire 80 or higher. I promise you I can't see anybody who's clicking this. Uh, it's not about judgment or uh, morality, folks. It's just about uh, getting the chance to see you know, where folks are at on this. So on the school, score on the poll so far, who scored 80 or higher? 25% uh, did. Congratulations. Again, we're staying in that almost that 80-20 sort of principle, the Pareto principle, we call it. Um, and so again, about 75% of you did not score 80 or higher. So let's just take it on the other side of things, folks. Who uh, scored on the questionnaire 50? Now let's go with 60 or lower. Okay, because these are folks that really are looking for a, a lot of help. So let's uh, let's go and uh, sorry, I actually have to take another second here. Scored uh, 60 or lower on the poll. And obviously this is going to be a yes or a no, folks. So again, please just take a couple of minutes, or a couple of seconds actually, and just stick a yes or no if you scored 60 or lower on the poll. So about 25% of you scored over 80, which is great, which means your why is very strong. And now there might just be some hows you're looking for, which is the part we're going to move into next. And we'll see if there's some folks that still do need some, some help with their why. And uh, certainly we will have some options for you to consider as we get through the night. So let's just end that poll and just see where we're at. Well, that was about 50% of you scored uh, 60 or lower on the poll. So again, as uh, has been my experience in 17 years as a professional coach consultant, um, the why is actually the place that I feel is the most important place to start. And uh, certainly there are some uh, work, there is some work to do for those of you that scored you know, 60 or lower on the why side of things because it will carry you forward, okay? What I'm going to do, folks, is, uh, and goodness, uh, heaven forbid, but uh, also heaven help that I can actually get, get this up and, uh, and working properly. I want to actually just uh, share a part of a, a screen with you here so that you can see some of the stuff that we're uh, working on. So um, hopefully this will uh, work the way it's intended to work. Uh, and if, you're, uh, if I've done this uh, properly, you can actually see my screen right now. And uh, as a result of that, if someone would just throw into chat whether they can see the the screen how to market. This is part of the hows. Can anybody just throw a quick chat up into there and just say whether they can uh, see the uh, see the screen or not? It'd be great for me to actually know that rather than just seeing my smiling face. So if anybody can help me out, just throw a quick chat in there. Yes, we can see it, Tom, or not. That would be uh, extremely helpful. So uh, I'm just going to assume that maybe you guys can right now, and uh, we'll uh, we'll carry on with uh, with with assuming that you can. So. Um, here's what I'd like to do, folks, is just walk through this, this part of the program with you so that you can uh, see some of the notes. 
And uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that maybe we should be sending some of these notes out to you afterwards. So uh, don't, uh, don't, don't worry too much about the how side of it because uh, I want to be sure that you've got all of the data that I can share with you. So I'm going to instruct my team to send these notes out to you or you can go to the website and download them. So again, when we're talking about how to market folks, basically what we're talking about here is two, two constructs, both in, inside your practice and outside your practice. And we can further break that or subdivide that into uh, procedures and special events. And procedures are things that just happen, you know, routinely all the time. Special events are things that happen, you know, more periodically. And so I would offer that younger practices, you're going to have a lot more focus on the external side of, uh, of marketing. And more mature practices may have a larger focus on internal. But I strongly suggest, folks, that it's an error in judgment to not carry on and um, do a bit of both, even if you've been in practice for 40 years, as some of my clients have. Because there are those poor and timid souls out there that you're not going to reach because you don't run in the same circles that everybody else does. And your circle of influence can only reach as far as the people that you touch in their lives. And so again, they're definitely in a more mature practice. There can be a trend towards internal uh, marketing, but do not neglect doing uh, external uh, marketing. I would also suggest, folks, that you definitely want to be looking at events and things that you can do that are congruent with your core values, okay? Because if they're congruent with your core values, then you're going to be that much more excited about doing it, okay? If you're excited about doing it, then you're going to follow through and you're going to take the time and it's going to be a joy while you're there. If there are things that are not congruent with your core values, then for heaven's sakes, stop doing them, right? Because when you're doing things that are not congruent with your core values, you're basically bringing about your own demise, as uh, Ayn Rand said. So let's just do a quick, some quick examples here, folks, of some of the hows. There's internal procedures, uh, things in a chiropractic office like the article of the week, table talk, healthcare demos, family referral requests, internal special events in my practice at a very event-oriented practice. So there was things like uh, appreciation days and focus groups and all kinds of you know, theme-related things, Christmas parties. And uh, we had like 250 people at a Christmas party one time. It was just a great, it was like a community event. Mini pot tournament, we had shirts made up, we had a, a trophy made up, there was plaques made up, it was a potluck, it was just, it was just awesome. Uh, external procedures, things like social media and website, which are just two of the most leveraged, scalable things you could be doing today. Of course, you know, if you've got a newspaper article, regular talk shows, some of my clients have. And of course, external special events or outside things like talks and fairs and health screenings and, and postal code mailings and, you know, that kind of stuff. So as we focus on the hows, folks, right, and, you know, we're really focusing on how to create a one-year plan. And if you've never created one before, which, again, 20 or sorry, 80% of you said you never have, Really what you're looking for here is um, you're looking to maybe start even, even just with one quarter, okay? Because if you start with just one quarter, then it's easy for you to, uh, and thank you folks, by the way, I just went to chat and you folks are telling me that you can see it, which is great. If you start with even just a quarter at a time, you can be more proactive and be ahead of the curve and be more promotional. Most of the chiropractors I work with in my coach advising practice are people that are uh, more from the, the vitalistic, if you will, side of uh, practice. Um, and so they want to be health promotional, they want to be preventative, but they're not necessarily doing it in every aspect of their life. And since 93% of human communication, folks, is nonverbal, it's not what the words you say, but it's what behind, what's behind the words you say that really gives the punch to your dialogue. If you're not being, if you're teaching prevention and promotion in your practice, but you're not living it in your life, in your business, then there isn't as much power behind your words. So if you want to get more powerful in your practice and have people get it and understand, work on your nonverbal. Work on being congruent with your values. Work on being congruent with your authentic self. Work on being congruent with prevention and promotion if that's the style of practice that you practice. Now, if you don't practice that style uh, and you're more of a reactive type person and only deal with people in crisis, that's fine. It's a choice, um, but you, so you don't need to worry so much about being ahead of the curve. But if you are more prevention and promotion oriented, you definitely want to be at least a quarter ahead of the curve on your marketing. And God willing, you'll be at a point in the not too distant future where you can literally be a whole year ahead, which is where my clients exist. So you want to start out by making a list of categories you presently do for marketing and, and you know, just to see what's out there. Um, having God willing, um, you've got a review about what is working and you have actually are tracking your return on investment so that you can actually see what your ROI is. If you're not tracking your return on investment, you're sort of working a little bit in the dark. Uh, which is a, a sad but true place that a lot of people work. And I'm certainly going to teach you and show you how you can be tracking your return investment and hopefully as a result of inspiring you and, and enrolling you in that possibility, um, if you're ever on another one of these types of calls, you'll never be, able to, you'll never be the person that says, yeah, I didn't uh, track my return investment. So once you've got a sense of, of what is and what isn't working, you want to dump whatever isn't working, folks, right? 
you just want to get rid of it. You don't want to be doing something that's a turkey, and so you want to get rid of that and just dump that. Uh, if you need more ideas, you know, obviously go to your, your coach or to your colleagues or whatever, and uh, you want to be definitely going to your ideal clients as well and coming up with things that, that you think would bring in people like that. Once you've got the list of activities and you've got it uh, categorized into each one of the four categories, folks, internal, external, special events, and, and uh, um, regular promotional things, you want to estimate your return on investment for each activity. It's a, it's a cross between an estimation and a guess, quite frankly, folks, right? So I call it a guesstimation. You say, okay, based upon thinking this through and what this talk is I'm going to do or this event or this website or this social media approach or whatever it is that you're going to choose to do, estimate how many leads you're going to get from it and then how many new clients you're going to turn those leads into. And by the way, folks, for, for clarity, a lead is only a lead if you get a name and at least an email address. If you're not collecting that, it's not a marketing event because you can't create a lead from it. So again, it might be a cool retention idea or just a cool idea, but it's not marketing if it's not going to create leads and or new clients. Okay, so let's just make that little distinction right up front here. So you want to estimate that you're going to get, you know, five leads and out of those leads you're going to convert 20%. So you're going to end up with, you know, one new client out of that. Depending upon your case average, you can then guesstimate the amount of money. Uh, most chiropractic uh, case averages work somewhere between the $500 and $2,500 range. So that means every new client is brings in somewhere between $500 and $2,500 worth of business throughout the lifetime of their care with you. And again, it's an average of an average, folks, right? Because some people come once and never come back. Some people come for the next 20 years. So again, a case average is an average of an average. And so if you know your case average, which hopefully you do, uh, if not, then you need to ask your coach how to design that or how to figure that out. Uh, you want to take your case average. And if you think you're going to attract, say your case average is $1,000 for easy numbers, and you're going to attract two new clients, well, then you're going to create $2,000 worth of revenue from that event. If it only costs you $500 to put on, then you take your $500 cost, you subtract it from your $2,000, it gives you $1,500 of the pure profit. $1,500 of the profit from a $500 investment is a 300% return on investment. I don't know about you folks, but that to me in my world is kick butt. That's awesome. And those are the kind of things you want to be able to estimate as you go forward and you keep the profitable ones, ditch the turkeys off or talk to your coach advisor about how to upgrade them to make them even more, um, you know, as my daughter, my daughter when she was three used to say, make them more better, okay? The next step is you want to flush out the project or idea as much as possible, writing out the steps, storyboarding we call that, so you can actually see all of the little steps. It's, you know, it's that goofy old cliche about how to eat an elephant, well, you eat it, you know, one bite at a time, right? And by eating it one bite at a time, you can take it down into little chunks and you know you can get the job done. And that's really what uh, taking this uh, idea of marketing is if you break it down into nice bite-sized steps, it's not so intimidating. And then as we talk about delegation in a minute, you can see how to go about you know doing more of that. Once you've got all the steps flushed out, folks, then you want to put it into a timeline, right? And you want to say that step needs to be done, you know, three weeks in advance of the event, and that step needs to be done. Once that step goes and the domino falls, this step is now you know two and a half weeks. And then this step is two weeks, and this step is a week and a half, and, and so on, until you basically got it all timeline right out to the successful completion of the uh, of the project. Okay. Once you've got all of it storyboarded, you want and all the timelines written out with exact dates on it. You want to be the leader and delegate as much as possible to your team. Right. If you don't have anybody on the team right now to delegate to, then enroll you know cousins, aunts, uncles, grandma, grandpa, friends, hire somebody, whatever you can do to get some help because. Uh, in case you hadn't noticed, there is a little bit of effort to put forth. There's a bit of energy exchange to plan this and do this properly. But it's like everything in life, folks. What you put into it is what you get out of it, which, you know, I recognized years ago was one of the keys to a very successful love life. So <laughs> thank you, my teachers, for helping me have a successful love life because what you give is what you get. What you put in is what you get out. And use that in your marketing as well. Once you've done this once, folks, it is not near as intimidating or near as time-consuming. Because next year, you're just going to leverage and cut and paste a lot of what you did this year that worked well into next year's. Doing the first one takes some time. But I promise you after that, it gets easier and easier and easier. Okay? Once you've got everything delegated that you can, then you want to go to your time management system, which we call your monthly planner sheets, and basically get everything you know, summarized in. And you want to definitely get the entire uh, year categorized and get everything laid out into a nice one-year calendar, which I'm going to show you how to do in just a brief moment. And finally, of course, folks, as we said earlier, I want you to track, track which efforts created leads and which ones converted those leads into new practice members 
you know, on the marketing calendar tracking to which uh, I'm going to go over with you here in the in a short period of time. In order to be more preventative for next year, folks, I want to see you guys do this. I want to see you take some right now, grab your day planners, your time management, your phone, whatever you do time management with, and book in your monthly planner for next October, November to complete next year's marketing calendar. Get it in there right now, even though October, November is quite a ways away. Get it planned now. Get yourself a literally a whole day planning meeting with you and your team to brainstorm, look at what worked this year because you're going to be tracking better. I'm going to show you how to do that um, and, and plan it for next year so that you can be ahead of the curve. Because, folks, by the time December comes around and the holidays come in and stuff, if you're starting to think about marketing in, in December for January, a lot of times you start January flat. And January can be a horrible, it can be the greatest month of the year, it can be the worst month of the year in business, all based upon how much promotion and, and how proactive you are you know, with things. Okay? So, uh, I already talked to you a little bit about return on investment, folks, but just to, you know, to give you a sense of some of the math here, right? Uh, let me just go through this really, really briefly. Um, one of the things you need to know, as I said, you need to know what your, uh, what your case average is. And so your case average is made up of a, of a simple multiplication of your office visit average, which is your average amount of dollars your average client leaves in your office every time they come. So you can take your normal fee and your extended appointment fees and your discounted fees or whatever, average, average, average. Figure out what it is. Multiply that by your PVA, which is the average number of times your average client comes in. And that'll be your case average. So if your client office visit average is 30, your PVA is 50, it's 30 times 50 or $1,500. Okay? So now, in order to see your ROI, what you want to look at is a little calculation down here. If you got three new clients from a patient appreciation day, just as you know, one example, right? Then you're going to take three. You're going to multiply $1,500, which is your case average. It's going to be $4,500. If it costs you, say, $1,000 to put on the event, that's $3,500 of pure profit, right? $3,500, um, uh, three and a half goes into that. You basically ended up with a 350 percent, you know, ROI, which, you know, my opinion for the thousand dollars invested is just an out of the park home run. So uh, again, simple, simple thing. That's one metric for measuring ROI, which is uh, basically based upon dollars and cents. And the other one, folks, is based upon time. Okay. So what you're going to be doing, God willing, you're going to, I can enroll you in this idea. You're going to be tracking the the time that you spend to put on events as well, because one might not cost you a lot of money, but it might cost you a lot of time. And so, if you just look at ROI from money, you might go, "Wow, that's a screaming, you know, great thing that produced great revenue for the business." But then you go and look at your total time expenditure, and you go, "Ooh, wow, that 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 actually took a lot of time." And it might be a great ROI from a dollars and cents standpoint, but it might not be such a great ROI from a, a return. So again. If the doc spent 12 hours, the team spent 30 hours for a total expenditure of 42 hours. Uh, using that other example, there's $4,500 worth of revenue. Uh, 42 hours spent, it's $107 an hour, which I would contend would be a, a you know a modest return on investment. Okay. So again, by tracking both aspects, folks, you can uh, you can really follow through and and find out what it is that's working and quite frankly what it is that isn't working. Okay. All right. Well, let's just uh, we're gonna I want to just share with you that other piece, folks. And uh, go back and, and just grab that uh, marketing calendar, which is uh, an important thing, I think, for you to see. And uh, assuming that the technology doesn't uh, let us down here, I should be able to go and grab a new screen share and uh, share that marketing calendar with you. And bad Google right now is not letting me share that, folks, so I, uh, I apologize. This uh, webinar platform is based upon uh, Google Hangout, which is a, a great platform, but uh, sometimes it does actually... Um, you know, have its little glitches and it can let you down. So I'm going to try that one more time, folks, and see if we can get the screen share to come up. It would be great to be able to uh, go over this with you. And again, it is really not happy right now for some strange reason. So um, we're going to um, figure out if, in fact, there's another way to do this. So let me just bear with me, folks, for a brief second uh, relative to the technology here. And we'll see if we can't get the screen share button to uh, to link back up again. So let's. And my guess, folks, is that I left you for just a minute. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, so uh, again, if you're still with me, uh, that would be great, and uh, we can see if, in fact, we can get the uh, all of the aspects of the webinar working again. 
So, oh, it looks as though we've got the uh, we've got the thing working again. So let's start the screen share, and uh, and get this back up. All right, folks. So if uh, all if you're still with me, um, then you can uh, see the screen share and you can see what we've got to offer here. So on this uh, particular uh, tool, it's an Excel spreadsheet, and if you can follow with me down to the bottom here in the uh, the marketing uh, grid, there's different tabs. There's a marketing grid, first quarter, second quarter, and so on. And so uh, basically, first quarter obviously broken up into the month of January, and of course over here the month of February, and you know obviously the month of March. And we've just cut and pasted some examples in here, folks. Okay, so in here is our internal marketing, and down below is our external marketing. And there's some examples here of things that you might put into this uh, as you're designing your plan. Articles of the week, your wow class, members of the month, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, here's the potential leads that this particular person feels they're going to generate and the numbers of clients. You'll notice there's a spot here to put the actual numbers of clients that you did and the actual numbers of leads that you did actually produce, which is an important metric to have because you want to be able to track your ROI, you know, diligently, right? Down here under external, there's a pathway magazine distribution, website, there's an area here to describe more, the dates of which these things are going to happen, and again, leads uh, and, and clients predicted. Uh, nice summary at the bottom here for how many total leads and how many total clients you're expecting for that particular month. It's a great way to do a summative thing. And of course, it's the same thing, folks, in the different, uh, the other aspects of the uh, calendar. This is just second quarter here, April, May, June, and, and so on. So now as we go through on the tracking side of things, folks, over here we have a, uh, an area called Q1 hours. And under Q1 hours, all of the different marketing events that you have are going to be listed and the particular month of the, of the year. And it's really easy at your meetings to just once a week to just sit down for, you know, literally a minute and a half and, you know, put in how many hours that you worked on, you know, each particular thing. Two hours on referral letters, you did an hour on social media, you didn't work on the website that week, you had two hours on newsletters. And you just basically, you know, fill it out and go through. So therefore, by doing it like this, simply on a week by week basis, with all the different activities that you worked on, it's easy to keep track of. And by being easy to keep track of, it's also easy to see, um, you know, and to total up at the end of the quarter. As you go through this, you're also going to track your leads. And uh, at the top here, if you've got Q1, January to March, you got your client names. So you had, you know, Bob Smith come in here in the early part of the month. Um, did they convert? It was a lead. Did they convert or not? You can decide. And then how did they get there? Did they come in, you know, through social media? You just put a simple X there. And again, you can track this and get your total leads and total conversions and your conversion percentage. So it's a very, very comprehensive uh, system, folks, and yet very, very simple to just keep up to date and do on a uh, regular basis. Um, you can also, of course, by, by keeping track of your hours and keeping track of your leads and new clients, it's very easy to go and do your ROI based upon the dollars and cents and the hours as I talked about earlier. So again, it's a very comprehensive. The tabs at the bottom, folks, will just you know go through the Q2. It's all the same stuff through all of the different quarters, Q2, Q3, Q4. And again, it's a great tool for keeping all of your marketing in one place you know, at one time. So again, what I want to do here, folks, is make sure that you've got a chance to, to get a copy of that. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, you guys get that. So I mean, it's going to be my gift to you. It's going to be a link afterwards where you can download that. And uh, I want you to have that as my gift to you as it was a way to have but yet one less excuse in terms of being able to, uh, to follow through and, and do what it is that you know that you, uh, you should be doing. Um, I'm getting some sort of a weird link failure here, folks. And so I, I hope that this is not a, a, a challenge for anybody here that in fact you're, you're still with me. I'm showing that there's still some viewers here. I've definitely lost some of my uh, functionality here with my Hangout. So uh, if you can just bear with me, I'm going to see if I can re-ascertain some, uh, some of this functionality. And if not, then uh, we're just going to carry on and, and uh, hope for the best here. So uh, what I'd like to do, folks, is to basically go through a couple of opportunities we have for you. Um, one of the things, as I said earlier, in my 17 years as a professional coach consultant, it's the why that at least 50% of you had a, scored a 60 or less on those 10 blocks. And so, you know, understanding the how is, is useful, but it's not near as useful as getting the why. So I'm talking to that 50% of you in the call that specifically were looking f that, that scored low on that uh, 10 blocks to marketing because I've created a program. It's a very simple little three-part uh, uh, seminar series. Uh, it's going to be done in a webinar uh, format starting next week, literally. 
It's going to be happening uh, two, two calls next week and one the week after. And it's called Releasing the Blocks. And the idea behind this, folks, is to work on those 10 blocks and see where you score on those. And then we're going to break them down into bite sized pieces. We're going to look at the psychology, the belief systems, and otherwise that may be locked into your conscious or subconscious minds. It's inhibiting you from sharing your gifts with the world. And as a result of that, help you break free from those chains that may be shackling you, get more connected to your why, get more connected to that spiritual covenant you have, that moral responsibility you have to share your gifts via the code of the trader with all of your brothers and sisters and get out there and, and be that strong you know, link in the chain. Um, this program is going to have handouts and seminar support. It's going to have unlimited email support. We're going to do a pre and post audit to see you know, how your score improves over the course of the webinar so we can validate that our time together was well spent. And again, that program, folks, is uh, usually uh, $397, uh, but until the end of the month, we've actually discounted it to $297. So if you're a, someone that wants to take action and wants to literally share more of your light with the world, uh, you literally have no excuse. Uh, I would say that your potential ROI on that $297 investment, assuming that you sign up by, by Friday at noon, uh, is going to be off the charts. Because if your case average runs, as the average carpenter does, between $500 and, and $1,500 or $2,500, uh, that $300 bucks you are going to invest uh, is going to be leveraged and leveraged and leveraged over the next you know, 2, 3, 5, 10, 25, 40 years of your career. Uh, it, it's going to be a great return on investment. So again, like all of our programs, we stand behind it 100%. If for some reason, by the end of the first night, you just think this isn't resonating with you, boom, no problem. You simply uh, shoot me an email or my admin team an email, and uh, no problems. We'll give you 100% of your money back. Uh, we don't want people involved in things that aren't going to serve them. We've got a lot of faith in the program. We've had a lot of success with uh, privately coaching people through these, and now it's just a way to leverage and, and, and reach more people by doing it in a, in a small group format. So if that's something you'd like to uh, be a part of, folks, there's going to be a link that you're going to be able to click after the, uh, the, the time together tonight, and you're going to be able to uh, follow that through. Uh, one other offer I have for you tonight, folks, is uh, an offer from the Meraki division of Full Circle, um, which, is, which is our parent company. And there is a, a pair of gentlemen, Mike and Rick, who are uh, college graduates that are just uh, marketing gems. They're gen wires. Uh, as you know, the people that you want working on your social media and your website stuff are people that are under the age of 25 because they were just born with a computer in their hands and, and or a, a smartphone. And so one of the most leveraged forms of marketing I'm advising my clients on right now is literally social media and the, you know, the digital age through, through technology, through website stuff. So what Rick and Mike have done is some of you people may have amazing websites and amazing social media, um, but you're, you just want to get a, a double check in on it. They've put together, the Meraki Division of Full Circle has put together an audit, which is where they can come in uh, into the heart and soul of your website, what makes it work what makes it look pretty or not, the functionality of it, what Google thinks of it. They've got this phenomenal multi-page audit that they've created um, that will give you a, site, a sense of how good your website people are doing on your, on, your, uh, uh, on your site and whether in fact it's providing the results that you want it to provide. And of course, so look at your social media profile. I was reading an article in Success Magazine by Gary Vaynerchuk, the gentleman that started the, uh, the wine uh, you know, uh, web TV show that is now you know, world famous and has millions of uh, people and his clients like General Motors and General Electric and Nestle and so on. And in the success uh, article, he was saying, you know, if you're not on social media within two years, your business just isn't going to be relevant anymore, folks. So I hate to tell you that the price of doing business these days is to be social media pro, you know, uh, sound. And if you'd like Rick and Mike to do an audit, basically they charge folks to my clients at Full Circle or to anybody that's come in through this program. Uh, their usual um, uh, investment in getting either one, either the social media or the technology website audit done is $97. Uh, but what they've decided to do, folks, is to bundle them together, and you can get uh, until January 31st, until this, this late this week, you can get both done for $97. And again, there'll be a link coming to you via email so you can watch for if that's something you're interested in, in investing in. Uh, and again, I, I don't think I need to talk to you about potential ROI for investing 100 bucks to get some uh, college grads to tell you just exactly where things are. And what they'll do, folks, they don't overwhelm you, is they'll just give you um, five top pieces of feedback relative to your social media strategy, what you should do in what order. They'll give you five feedbacks about how to engage more people on your, uh, your website and five pieces of data about how to take it to the next level so that you don't get overwhelmed. Because literally, folks, in these audits, I have seen like hundreds of recommendations. So what are the top fives? What's the low-hanging fruit that will get, uh, get you going? Uh, and uh, again, I highly recommend if you're not, uh, haven't had an audit done before, 
you don't know where you stand in the social media world or the website world, definitely invest in uh, those audits. I mean, for 100 bucks, you just can't miss, folks. So, Anyways, folks, that is uh, where I wanted to take you tonight. And uh, if I, my math is correct, we're stopping right on the top of the hour. So I appreciate you being with us. I appreciate you investing time out of your lives to uh, spend some time with us tonight. We appreciate it. God willing, something I've said tonight will move you forward towards understanding your why or how relative to marketing. And the uh, end result will be more people like young Francois that I served for many years in my practice that will get under care as a result of you being on this broadcast tonight. So, folks, wherever you are in the world, enjoy your evening, and uh, God bless and take care. Good night, everyone.